Hello everyone and welcome to this very special episode on self-isolation. This is <laughs> an episode I never thought that I would have to create. I, I never thought that I would be releasing to people. It was just an issue that I never felt that I would have to deal with personally. And it was never something that I felt I would have any particular experience or expertise to, to share with people, even in smaller isolated examples of where isolation is put into place. We, we really are facing a, an unprecedented situation at the moment and there's nothing we can do about it. There's nothing that we can change or stop or prevent at the moment. We just have to face up to current circumstances and deal with them as best we can. And actually, you know what? As humans, we are thoroughly <laughs> tough creatures. We have faced a lot Collectively, as a species, we've faced a lot through history. We can say that even though this is a, a very sort of uh, worrying and real situation with a very large scope, I think we can actually argue that we have faced worse in the past and we have gotten over it. And we're so much better equipped here today to deal with uh, an epidemic like this than at maybe any other time in history. So I think right off the bat, I think the first thing to do is to, to have some perspective and ultimately have a little bit of gratitude in this situation. I know that's incredibly hard to say and it's a difficult shift to muster. And it does sound like a little bit of a platitude that, oh, we should be grateful for the things that we do have. But I often think it's in these situations, when we get tested, when we get challenged, that actually we start to really realize what's important in life and realize what we have and to realize what we can be grateful for rather than realize what we don't have and what we're not necessarily grateful for. So right off the bat, I think this is a really important perspective to start off with. And I think it's so important to keep this mindset and keep our, our psychology strong during this period, to have the gratitude, to have the hope, to have the perseverance, to have the faith. And it's with these things that we're going to get through this. It's with these things that we're going to be able to work together, that we're going to be able to uh, cooperate and collaborate, and ultimately, we're going to beat this coronavirus. I'm, I'm sure of it. It's just going to take some time. And one of the things that I want to share with you today is how we can better uh, face this time and how we can, we can better face up to some of the, the parameters and some of the precautions and some of the, the rules and regulations that have now been set in in this period. So let me give a little bit of context as to why I found myself delivering this training and, and where some of the things I'm going to share with you have come from. So we have only, at the, the time of uh, recording this, only very recently gone into national lockdown in the UK. And I know we're a little bit uh, behind the, the ball in this, uh, in this respect. Other countries have been doing this sooner than us, and I'm sure even at the time of recording, this is already going to be old news because it's already shifting so quick. I'm sure other countries will be doing different things and different measures will be coming in. So at the time of recording, I, know, I can only talk about <laughs> what experiences I hear so far and um, what's been happening so far. I just came out a period of a 14 day self-isolation with my wife. And this was actually before we had the national lockdown where actually Everyone's just being told to stay at home anyway now. We had to do it because my wife was displaying corona symptoms. And ultimately, after looking at the, uh, the government guidelines, looking at the symptoms and sort of seeing firsthand myself, uh, I think that my wife did actually have coronavirus. We couldn't get tested, but all the symptoms matched up. She felt very different to any other just normal cold or normal flu or normal virus. So watching on as a, as a non-professional uh, medical advisor, um, I think she had it. Luckily, I didn't have any symptoms, and luckily she has now recovered from her symptoms. So we're able to come out of our 14-day isolation in one respect, in terms of, fingers crossed, we are no longer carriers of the virus. Now, we don't really know how this actually works. We don't know whether you can catch it twice. We don't know whether you develop immunity to it after you've caught it or after you've been exposed to it. If I didn't display any symptoms, does that mean that I'm immune to it? Does it mean that I'm a dormant carrier? Uh, we, we just don't know. 
So we actually went into an isolation period a little bit before the national lockdown actually came in. So <laughs> just as we were getting ready to come out of our isolation, it turns out everyone's being put into isolation anyway. What I want to share is some of the things that uh, I learned and realized during this isolation and we maybe had a little bit of a head start in this respect in the UK at least. I know other countries have been locking down a lot sooner than we have. We had a little bit of a head start in terms of starting to see what self-isolation was going to look like and, and how to deal with it and approach it. Now the caveat here is that there are two different experiences that I'm talking about here. There is my wife's experience where she was actually ill and there was my experience where I was self-isolating but I wasn't ill. So obviously there's different scope in terms of what you can do and what your priorities are compared to whether you are ill isolating or you are uh, precaution isolating. I'm not going to talk too much about the ill isolating because number one, I didn't experience it. I had a secondhand experience uh, viewing my wife. Uh, and number two, actually from what I've seen, there's not really much you can do about it. You've just got to let your immune system kick in, you've got to have faith in your, your body's defense mechanisms, um, and just look after yourself, try and, and get the sleep and, and get the rest. Uh, you, can, you can take medication to ease the symptoms for the headaches and, and things like that. My, uh, my wife's experience was that she was feeling the headaches and the fatigue aspect of it quite a lot. And there was even times where she was light sensitive. So she was just having to sit in the bedroom with uh, the blinds down, the lights off. And all she could actually do was just listen to podcasts. All she could do was listen. She couldn't read, she couldn't watch stuff. Um, so that might be common to people's experience when they have the virus, or that might just be her individual sort of experience of it. I don't know because I'm not a medical professional. I haven't seen other experiences. So I'm not going to talk too much about that because as I said, that's more a case of just rest, look after yourself, and trust in your body's immune system to, to push through that. What I'm going to talk about here on this episode is more of my experience, which I think in the current situation is actually going to be the more common experience, that most of us are isolating as a precaution rather than because we are actually ill with it. They think that even at the, the peak of this curve, the, the curve that is being talked about so much, um, they're estimating that at the peak of the curve as many as a quarter of people could be ill at any one time. So, by the way, that's a lot of people. That's, that's millions and, and, and in some cases even billions of people. However, three quarters of people will not be ill, but they will still be undergoing the isolation procedures. So how can we deal with that? And that's what I'm going to be covering in today's episode. And I've got this split into, into two parts. First of all, we're just going to talk about the basics. So this is the basic fundamental kind of survival level stuff of what should you be doing on a consistent basis whilst you're isolated? What are you doing to just give yourself the, the bare minimum chance of getting through this? And as I said in the title of this video, what are the basics that you need to do to, to stop yourself going absolutely crazy in this situation? Because Isolation is a very unnatural experience. We as humans are social creatures. We're supposed to be in social settings. We're supposed to be in varied environments. Even the most introverted of us need changes in environment and need communication with people. There's a reason why isolation and solitary confinement are used for our worst and most hardened criminals because it's actually a very effective punishment. And I'm sad to say that in this situation, what we are essentially going through is a form of punishment. It's unnatural and it's unhealthy for us. As I said, there's nothing that we can do about it. So we've got to learn how to mitigate some of these uh, negative consequences and try to get through it and survive as best we can. So that's what I'm going to be covering in the basics. Then in the second half, I'm going a little bit more positive, a little bit more optimistic. And I'm going to highlight some of the opportunities that are coming out of this. Now, I think overall, isolation is a bad thing. I'm not going to pretend that isolation is a good thing. As I said, it's hugely unnatural, hugely unhealthy. But if we've got to deal with the situation anyway, 
it does change some variables and it does change some factors which in certain circumstances give us an advantage. In certain ways open up opportunities and that's what I'm going to finish this episode on on a little bit of a lighter note because Christ I think we need some lighter notes in the world right now and a little bit more of a positive note of if this is going to be a long-term thing for example, here in the UK, we are currently in a three-week lockdown. So we've got to find a three-week solution to the, the current problem. Now, my prediction, and this is just purely my opinion on a UK basis, it's not going to last three weeks. I think when we get to the end of three weeks, they are not going to relax procedures. Because we we're a little bit slower on the uptake and because we started shutting down things slower than some other countries, I think we're actually going to need to continue this for longer and I think there will be another three week period of lockdown. So I think we're facing at least six weeks of this very sort of stringent strict lockdown and my goodness that is a long time to be locked down. That is a long time to be um, to all intents and purposes significantly isolated. So we've got to find some ways that we're not just going to get through this, but actually try and take something from this period. Rather than just letting six weeks of our life go to waste, what can we actually do in this period that once we start to come out of this, once we start to have uh, measures and precautions relaxed a little bit, as some of the, the risk and fear starts to go down a little bit, how can we continue to grow and adapt along the way? As I say all the time with All For Your Life, we get to choose our story. Our story is not written for us, it is written by us. And even a global pandemic is not going to write our story for us. We still get the option. We still get the choice every day of waking up with a blank page, with a new chapter of our life waiting to be written. And we can decide what we're going to do with that opportunity. And that's what I'm going to cover a little bit more in the second half of this session. So let's launch into this. Let's start with the basics of how you can survive in this situation. What are some of the fundamental stuff, fundamental habits, practices, procedures that you need to put in on a daily basis to stop yourself going absolutely crazy and to try and keep some semblance of sanity, some semblance of well-being. What I'm predicting from this crisis, and you can take this here on the on whatever the, the, the date is, 28th of March, isn't it? On the, on the 28th of March, you can take this prediction right now that I think there are two, not unanticipated problems from this crisis, but two problems that are not really being covered enough because we're focusing so much on the physical health disease risk. The first of these is we're going to have a mental health problem. Big mental health problem. As I said, this isolation is unnatural, it's unhealthy, and people's mental health is really going to suffer. I think we're going to have tons of instances of depression, anxiety. I think that some of our, our medical services are going to be strained in other ways, that suddenly they're going to have a huge influx of people needing treatment for mental health illnesses as well as this virus illness as well. And I don't think that has really been talked about enough and I don't think it's been really prepared for enough. So if you are a therapist or a counsellor and you're doing your virtual Zooms and Skypes counselling sessions, I think you're going to have more people than you can possibly serve in this scenario because I think there's going to be a big mental health problem and what I'm going to talk about today, hopefully it's going to help alleviate a little bit of that mental health problem because I think all of us, all of our mental health is going to take a little bit of a battering in this scenario. The second unanticipated problem is a social one and it goes back to talking about how we as humans are social creatures, even the most introverted of us need these interactions, need these relationships, need these connections. Now, if you are isolating in a household where you're in a couple or you're in a family, you are going to experience this a little bit less and that is a very protective factor in this regard. But for the, the solo people, for those who are, are living alone or find themselves essentially living alone, perhaps you, you live with a, 
uh, someone who works in the NHS, for example, you're not going to be seeing very much of them at all in this period. This is going to create a huge problem of loneliness. And loneliness is actually a significant physical health uh, risk factor. What research has found, and I was astonished by this, by the way, what research has found is that loneliness is a greater physical health risk than smoking 10 cigarettes a day. 10 cigarettes a day. And we think of how bad and objectively a much of a, a risk factor smoking cigarettes is. And loneliness is a worse risk factor than that. And again, this is something that I don't feel is being talked about. And I genuinely think, and this will sound really odd and a bit ridiculous, but I genuinely think that during this period, people are going to die of loneliness. That's how much of a risk factor it is, and it's something that we really need to protect for during this time. So with this in mind, here are some of the basics that I think we can do to protect ourselves on this basic fundamental level. Obviously, in terms of our physical health, we're protecting ourselves, but we need to protect our mental health and we need to protect our social health as well. So let's look at what these three measures that I suggest are. First of all, we've got our R, and the R stands for routine. During this period, make sure you stick to your routines. Make sure you stick to the things that keep you disciplined, that keep you consistent, that keep you on an even keel. So what do I mean by this? Sleep at your regular times. Sleep at your regular times so you're getting adequate sleep and you're getting the sleep that works best for you. Make sure that you're eating good food. Yes, I know that it's more difficult to get food in just now and it's more difficult in terms of the restrictions that we have on, on going out and shopping and of course there are shortages in certain areas. But I'll actually tell you one thing in my experience of shopping during this crisis so far. There has always been loads of fruit and veg in the supermarkets. Not just the, the little shops that maybe people aren't visiting, but actually in the supermarkets there has always been lots of fresh produce, particularly in the fruit and veg department. Because what are most people doing right now? They are panic buying your pastas, your rices, things like frozen pizzas. They're, they're, they're buying dry goods. People aren't actually buying fresh foods because fresh food doesn't last, so you can't panic buy it. So actually, if you're still able to go out and you're, you're still able to get to the shops on a, a reasonably regular basis every couple of days or so, actually there's a lot of fresh foods available. So it's not difficult to eat healthy during this period. There are a lot of options that are there available. So you make sure you are eating good food. Don't just start going to the junk food and the processed rubbish just because it's a, it's a crisis and you, you want that comfort food and, and you want that kind of uh, chemical rush of, of sugar and, and salt and preservatives. Stay on your food game. Stay eating as healthy as possible. So that's your sleep, your nutrition, and then the third part of that kind of health triad is, of course, your exercise. So I was actually quite fortunate during that 14-day period that I was talking about was that, number one, I didn't have any symptoms, and number two, the national lockdown hadn't kicked in. It was only a, a personal lockdown for me. So what I was doing during this period was I was driving into the into the, the hills and the countryside of Scotland and I was going on, on hikes and I was basically taking my self-isolation and sticking it in the middle of the country because I could go to places where there was almost no one and in fact a couple of times there was no one. I was in a valley or I was up a hill by myself and it was, it was, it was lovely. It was able to get me out of the house, get some fresh air, a change of environment a really good sort of exercise rush of getting up a hill and having a nice long hike. That has now changed with the national lockdown where you are still being allowed out to exercise, but unnecessary travel and in particular going into rural communities, they're very worried about because rural communities don't have the, the same resources and don't have the same personnel as the urban communities. So that option has now disappeared for me, but there are still ways in which you can exercise. 
So even now with the national lockdown, one of the four exceptions that uh, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson laid out, there's four exceptions to this national lockdown at the time of filming. Now this, of course, could actually change by the time that you're listening to this, but at the moment, the, the four reasons why you're allowed out are for your food shopping as uh, infrequently as possible, to uh, provide care for a relative, uh, to travel to essential work, and the fourth reason is actually to exercise once a day. Take advantage of one of those four exceptions and make sure you are exercising. Now there's loads of different ways to do this and, and some of the, uh, the personal trainers and the yoga teachers have been getting really inventive and creative and they're hosting their online classes and their online sessions. Jump on them. There's blooming tons of them now. So make sure you're getting some kind of exercise, some form of home workout. So this could be your, your kind of exercise circuit on a mat, doing, doing your, your press ups and your, your crunches and things like that. It could be some kind of aerobic sort of exercise of whether you're doing dancing or, or Zumba or, or Pilates or any of that kind of stuff. And you can even just kind of dance, <laughs> dance around your, your home, stick on some music and, and dance. That's one of my favorite ways of exercise. So make sure you're getting that exercise as well. So this is where the basics start, is keep your routine, keep structured, because that structure is going to provide you the stability in this unstable time. So all of the things that you regularly do, make sure you're doing them. Meditation, for example, is another one. So for me, I've got my 20 minute meditation practice in the morning, I'm still doing my meditation. Keep doing the things that you would always do that are part of your consistent routine, and that will provide some of the structure and some of the discipline that will help you get through this. So first of all, we've got our routine. Keep your routine. Second of all, and I've already just touched upon this, get yourself outdoors. Now I know we're being told to stay in the home, and yes, you should follow these precautions, but you are allowed outdoors in certain ways and in certain situations. So if you have your own personal garden, you can go out in your personal garden. And luckily for those of us who are here in the West, in the Northern Hemisphere, we are now going from winter into spring and spring is ultimately going to go into summer as this goes on. So actually in terms of when this could have happened, thank God it didn't happen in winter because our services would have been a lot more stretched and it would have been a lot more uncomfortable, it would have been a lot more depressing because we would have had the cold, the dark nights, we would have had seasonal affective disorder on top of the, the mental health hit that we're going to take as well. So make sure you get outdoors. So for example, for us, we get that uh, one exercise per day. Take advantage of that. So get out for a cycle, get out for a run, we're allowed to walk around the parks as long as we stay as far away as possible from each other. So make sure you are getting outdoors. It gives you that fresh air, it gives you that oxygen, it gives you a change of environment, it stops you getting a little bit of cabin fever, and also, really important, thinking in terms, again, the time of year, you're going to get some of that vitamin D from the sun. So if it's a sunny day, make sure you get out in that sun. That vitamin D is going to make you feel better. That's a preventative measure against poten potential mental health issues. So make sure you are getting outdoors. Take advantage of that one exercise session that you're allowed and find a way in which you can exercise. Now, I thought I was onto a winner with my hiking. I was like, yeah, that's great. I can just drive out into the national park and I can find a hill or I can find a valley and I can just go and isolate myself there because there's nobody about. We now actually can't do that because the, the mountain rescue uh, is, is no longer sort of there um, and because there are no sort of kind of safety precautions for, for being out there on your own um, in terms of unnecessary travel as well, even just sort of taking taking the virus on, on your car and uh, could be on my rucksack and, and all sorts of things. I thought I was onto a winner, but I now can't do that. But you may be in an area where you have access to a part of the countryside. Maybe you've got some kind of canal, maybe you've got some kind of park, maybe you're in the suburb somewhere. If you have access to a good piece of outdoors and a good piece of nature, 
take advantage of that and get into it. If you don't have that, still get yourself outdoors in some capacity. Even if it's just taking the bin out, <laughs> and this is the, the sort of the direness of the situation we find ourselves in, take the bin out and just chill for 10 minutes out by your bins. And I know that sounds like the least appealing thing in the world, but get yourself out there, get that little bit of fresh air, change of environment, even if it's down with, with all of your refuge, all of your trash, as we might say in North America. Uh, that's that's the, the situation we find ourselves in. You've got to find some kind of way to get yourself outdoors. Get in your garden, take your bins out, go for a walk around your block, staying as far away from people as you can. Find a, a nice space in the outdoors if you can, but make sure you are getting outdoors. Change up that environment, get that vitamin D, and you can do some of your exercise outdoors as well. So you get a kind of a two for one bonus here. Thirdly, the third basic thing that we need to do is make sure we are not losing connection. Now, I don't mean this in terms of your Wi-Fi connection and the Netflix binging that you're doing right now. Although, yes, absolutely, that will be a pain if the Wi-Fi goes down. Actually, today, the Wi-Fi went down in, <laughs> in our apartment and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> can this situation get any worse? Luckily, it, we managed to get back up and running and it's working okay now. So I don't mean your internet, I mean your human connection. Make sure you are staying connected to your fellow human. So have the WhatsApp group chats, have the Facebook groups, do what you can to stay connected. Have these interactive online meetings that, that we're having now. You might still be at work and working from home. Try and get those online meetings. Try and, try and book in uh, productive, useful work meetings because then you're going to have a little bit of this connection with other people. One of the, the kind of inventive things that we did during this period was he, we had a, a virtual dinner party uh, with one of my friends in the Netherlands. So me and my wife sat down here in Scotland <laughs> and we dressed up. She put on a dress, I put on a suit and we made our dinner here. And then uh, him and his roommates over in the Netherlands, they dressed up in suits and they made their dinner. And we had a virtual dinner party for, I think we're online for about four hours or something like that. So these are some of the inventive ways that you can keep this connection. As I said, we're actually fortunate in so many respects that this is the best time in history to be isolated because we have so much technology to mitigate against that isolation. My... Toastmasters group, my public speaking organization, we're now doing all of our meetings online. So actually, uh, we have uh, our first online meeting coming up tomorrow, and we're going to be doing our normal public speaking sessions, but we're going to be doing it on a group Zoom. So these are all the ways that you can inventively make sure that you still have that connection in your life, still be speaking to people, and not just in terms of your emails and messages, because that is a, a kind of the lowest form of connection. It, it's still a form of connection, let's make use of it, but actually try and book in these virtual face-to-faces because it will feel more real and it will protect and mitigate against that loneliness. So these are your basics. This is just to kind of keep yourself as sane as possible, keep yourself surviving, and keep yourself striving through this period. These are your basic fundamentals just to find some stability and, and find some purchase during this situation. What I'm going to move on to now are the opportunities this provides. And actually, I think what this situation has done is it really has sort of illuminated what's important and what's not. And although it's a very serious situation, and although we're seeing some of the, the less than good aspects of humanity, the, the panic buying, the, the hoarding, the, the, let's face it, selfishness, the, the hysteria, I've also seen in my industry in particular something that I find really disgusting, and I will use that word disgusting, is people in my industry, people who are in a position of leadership and influence, are using fear-based messaging, exploiting the fear and hysteria that people have 
to sell their products and services. And I just find that really gross at a time where entire industries have shut down overnight, at a time where so many people have just lost their jobs with a snap of the fingers, at a time where many of the self-employed have just completely lost their business model, for those to be finding a way to manipulate and exploit the situation for their personal gain, I just think really demonstrates the worst of humanity. And we are going to see the worst of humanity in this period, let's face it. And this, by the way, is not to say that it's unethical to sell anything during this period, because let's face it, we're buying food from the supermarkets, aren't we? We're paying Zoom for the, its, you know, its premium subscription so we can use, use more of its features. So selling things that are useful in this situation is not a bad thing at all. Ultimately, at the end, end of the day, I run a business and, and my business needs income in order to survive. And absolutely my income is, is taking a hit at this period and I'm, I'm planning and mitigating for that hit that it's going to take during this time. So it's not unethical to sell things that are useful. What I don't like is deliberately manipulating people using this, this um, very sort of nasty side of social psychology in order to make people buy things that they don't necessarily want or they don't necessarily need or aren't necessarily going to help them. You know, the, the snake oil salesmen who are, are selling things that they say will stop you catching the virus or will boost your immune system and it's just all oh, absolute BS. I, I can't stand that, it's horrible, it's disgusting. So I think we are seeing some bad aspects of humanity, but I also think we're seeing some great aspects of humanity right now as well. I think there is this real global collective we're in this together attitude that we haven't really had at any other time in our history. And it's something that has been really missing from humanity for a while now. And I think a lot of our recent problems and crises and, and disconnects and divides in our society have come because we have not had this collective we're in it together. And this situation actually seems to be fostering that. And it's, it's shown the best of people that I think people now are thinking about how they can help each other more from in terms of the people who are out there on the front lines doing these important jobs to try and keep society functioning as best it can to the simple community things that we're doing like do, um, getting shopping for people who are in isolation, uh, getting on phone calls to, to chat to some of these isolated and lonely people. I know for me certainly in terms of what I do for your life, I've really been thinking over these, these past couple weeks so far, what can I do to help and serve more? Because I recognize I'm in a position where I can offer a voice of hope, of inspiration, and, and that's why I'm coming on here and, and doing this training today, because I feel it's something that I can put into the world that's, that's going to help people and going to serve people during this difficult time. And I'm thinking about how I can help and serve to an even larger degree, because I know I'm in a position where I have knowledge, skills, experience, where I can do that. So I think this is a positive aspect that we're seeing. There's positive aspects coming out of this. And I also think some opportunities are being opened up by, on an individual level, our self-isolation, and on a collective level, our collective isolation as well. So let me outline what these opportunities are. <laughs> Let's finish this session on a slightly higher note and a slightly more positive note. Think about, well, how can we make the most of this situation? Because we're faced with it, we can't change it, we can't stop it. How do we make the most of this? So opportunity number one, and this is more on an individual level, perhaps there's a bit of collective level on this as well. But the first opportunity that we have is an opportunity for learning. We're stuck inside with very little to do if we're not in a, some kind of key job or key role. Take some time to invest in your learning. Read the books, watch the video tutorials, start practicing that musical instrument, whatever it might be, that language that you wanted to learn, get on Duolingo and start practicing that language a couple times every day. What this isolation is doing is it's actually filtered out a lot of our normal distractions, obligations, and duties. And this has opened up more time that we can now invest in ourselves. Investing in that learning. 
So what is a, a skill or a pastime that you've been meaning to work on for a while and it's always just kind of fallen to the bottom of the to-do list? There's always been something more urgent or something of a higher priority that has come to the fore that's taken away that time. Well, now a lot of those things have disappeared. How can you use these opened windows of free time to start learning, to start investing in yourself? What are some of the skills that you can build? Now, of course, there are going to be restrictions on some of this. If one of the skills that you wanted to learn was, funnily enough, I'll use an example that I talked about earlier, public speaking. Well, all the public speaking is gone now. You're not going to be able to stand on stage in front of an audience and practice your public speaking. But even then with that example, there are different ways to simulate public speaking and I'm doing it right now, aren't I? I'm standing in front of an audience, admittedly I can't see you at the moment, but I am addressing an audience and I am speaking to you. And I've got to communicate in an effective way with what I'm saying, how I'm saying it. You can see my hands flying about at the moment, the gestures that I'm using. So even with something like that, there's an adaption that you can make where you could still be learning in that scenario. So either something that you can definitely learn in its fullest extent, or even something that you can learn in an adapted partial way. So this is the first opportunity that I think is being presented to us. We've got a lot of free time, let's work on some skills and come out of this period as real badasses, as being really skilled and tooled up on something that we weren't skilled and tooled up on before. And say, well, you know what? If this crisis hadn't happened and I hadn't had that period of time to just invest in myself, I would have never acquired the, these skills and this knowledge and this experience in this particular endeavor. So let's use this as an opportunity for learning. Our second opportunity, and somewhat linked to this, this is an opportunity for creativity. So as well as learning new things, be creative in what you are already good at or what you already work on in the world. So for me, for example, in terms of the way that my business is working, everything in person has just been taken away. So my, my seminars and my live events, they're gone. And that actually takes up a, a fair bit of my time. Uh, speaking for other people's events and to other audiences, speaking gigs, they're gone. And again, that takes up a significant proportion of my time. So in this period of isolation, I've been doing a lot of writing, and actually I've been doing a lot of filming. I've been doing a lot of, of video work. So I've taken this time to get really creative. And actually, in terms of the book that I'm working on at the moment, just because of the way that I've, I've set up my, my calendar and the way that I've set up my projects for this year, I haven't had that much time to work on the book. I have been working on it in a very piecemeal fashion. Suddenly with so many of my, my kind of duties and, and normal roles just gone, I've actually made as much progress on the book as I think I have up until this point on it in terms of how much I've produced, how much I've developed, how much I've written. So use this as an opportunity for creativity. Get into a, a, a deep work creative space, as Cal Newport would say, the author of Deep Work, where you just have all distractions removed, and that's what self-isolation has kind of forced us to do in a lot of ways, and get some creative work done. Start building some things, start developing some things, and this could take a lot of different forms. So you don't have to be a business owner in order to be doing creative stuff. This could be your music hobby in terms of learning to, to play new music or creating new music, artwork, drawing new things, making new things. I know, for example, my, uh, my, uh, my little half-brother, and you'll hate me mentioning him on a, on a session, by the way, but my little half-brother, he is an amazing mechanic. He, I'm, the, I'm the wordsmith of the family. He's the engineer of the family, and he, he actually has his own workshop uh, set off from the house and he works on things during his workshop and this period of isolation for him is great because he's just gone into his workshop and he's he's just building stuff and he's just trying out new things he's he's learning some of his engineering skills he's, he's pushing himself and developing new stuff 
So this is a period where you can be creative, whether it's just in your hobbies and pastimes, or whether it's in your work and in your business. How can you be more creative during this period? So that's the second opportunity that's presented to us. Then thirdly, our final opportunity We actually have, in a weird way, more opportunity to, for interaction than we did before. And this is because, again, funnily enough, because a lot of things have been removed, and in particular all of these in-person gatherings and meetings have been removed, there are now opportunities where you can interact in new environments and with new people. So I know, for example, some of the uh, the networking groups and the associations that um, I've spent time in and I've done networking in, they are now advertising that they are doing virtual networking, where they're now running their meetings online. So you can actually go and meet people who are in a different city, who maybe you wouldn't have gotten on the, the train and gone to another city just for a networking event, but you can log on to a Zoom or whatever other sort of software they're using, and you can now virtually network with those people. That's an opportunity that you probably wouldn't have taken in the past, but you do have now. I know for me, one of the things that I've been doing is take advantage of these virtual interactions. I just booked in a ton more podcast interviews. I went on to a couple of the Facebook groups that I'm in, and I said, look, listen, I think in this time, we need some voices of inspiration. I think we need some voices of hope. I think people need to hear from as many different sources as they can. Strategies, tools, ideas that are going to help us get through and go through this crisis. So I sent out almost like a, a little call to arms in some of these groups. And <laughs> holy crap, so many people got back to me and so many people replied. I've actually got more people replied than than interview slots that I have for the rest of the year. I'm now going to have to work out who I choose out of these people to do. Firstly, just, I was hoping to get some people to do for this next quarter, what I anticipate to be these next three months of real peak difficulty. So I wanted about 12 interviews to do an interview once a week. Well, pff, I've got them already. They're already booked into the calendar. I've got 12 people now. Now I'm looking at, well, how many more people am I actually going to book in? And does it get to the point where if I've got everything booked in for the rest of the year, do I actually start to release more interviews and do I actually start to, to put more people's voices onto my podcast potentially? And that was something that I never would have anticipated. That actually my podcast in a way has benefited from this because so many people, and again this goes back to what I was saying that this is actually exposing the best of humanity. So many people raised their hand and said, yes, David, I'll be that voice. I'll come on the podcast. I'll share my story. I'll share my message. And so I'm actually in a position where potentially my podcast is going to really benefit from this crisis. That actually there is a, a sort of silver lining to this cloud that my podcast probably wouldn't have had that kind of exposure and that kind of attention if we hadn't been in this situation. So that's one thing I've done in terms of interactions is I've I've booked in all of these interviews and I'm starting to do a little bit more virtually as well, communicating a little bit more in some of these Facebook groups, thinking about some of the, the online things that I can do more with All For Your Life. So running more live sort of online sessions and, and putting my, my workshop material into more of an online format and putting that on again. So again, there's these opportunities for interactions. You can, I'm signing up to a couple sort of educational uh, interactions as well, going on on uh, live webinars and, and live workshops where actually other people will be there as well. And to be honest, I wouldn't have done that if we hadn't been in the situation where so much of the existing connection interaction had been removed. Well, I'm now saying, well, I've got to find some other ways to interact and to connect and, and sort of connect with people who maybe I wouldn't have connected with if this situation hadn't arose. So there's actually an opportunity in here to diversify your interactions, to try out new groups, to immerse yourself in new communities, to make connections with new people, to, to grow your network, to, to find new communities, to, to perhaps even get some friends or, or mentors out of this situation. Like, really, we, do, we just don't know what the social ramifications of this situation are going to be 
on both sides of the coin. As I said, I think we have underestimated the social ramifications of loneliness, but I also think maybe we're underestimating how much more this is going to connect us globally. That yes, we've always had this technology, we've always had these means to connect with each other. And in many respects, we have already used this. You know, I have friends who are across in the States who I've met either from uh, going across to the States and meeting them in person and then continuing that relationship virtually, or actually I've just plain met people in a virtual scenario and they've come on the podcast, or I've formed a relationship with them, or we've done some promotional stuff together. But I actually think that although the technology has started to be used in this way and to uh, all intents and purposes, a lot of people have been in this very interconnected way. I think this is going to become a lot more mainstream and we're going to be even more virtually connected than we were before this situation. And I think that's a real positive to come out of this. So this has been a fairly long session, but I think we need a, a fairly sort of deep session to deal with a, a, a fairly significant crisis and a very significant situation. So this is what I've been learning from my self-isolation period a little bit before uh, the, the kind of national lockdown came in. So I'm going to have to actually vary and adapt what I'm doing because some of my coping strategies like going out for a nice long hike in the Scottish hills, I can't do that anymore under the new parameters, the new guidelines. So I'm going to have to find some new adaptions and new things to what I've been doing so far. But this is what I have learned so far and this is what I have really been finding is working. And I hope it's going to work for you as well. Because I think we need to look after ourselves so much in this situation. Ultimately, if we're able to look after ourselves as individuals, then that helps us to come together better as a collective. And some of what I've shared in this training is going to help you to do that. You've got your basic stuff to keep some form of, of sanity and stability, but also I think is really important, find some of these opportunities as well. Find the silver lining in the cloud. And ultimately, if we're able to do that, I think we can look back on this situation and say it was serious and not to downplay the people who have died and will die in this situation, not to downplay the, the, the stress and hardship that this has caused, people losing their jobs, people going bankrupt, all of the other potential social ramifications that are coming, not to belittle any of what is happening and what will come to pass in this situation. But we will be able to look back and say, actually what the situation did do was it brought about these positive changes, these positive benefits. And because we can't stop or change the situation, all we can really hope for now is to try and find those positive changes and those positive benefits as best we can. So thank you for joining me today. I hope you found this useful and I hope this is something you can continue to rely on and stabilize yourself on as we go through this situation. You can get through this. We will get through this. We as humanity, we as humans, we're tough, we're strong, and we can do this, and we will overcome.